And it's good to be here today. We want to welcome you. Whether you're joining us in person today or whether you're joining us online, we are honored to have you today. And my prayer is the Lord will encourage your faith. As we pick up with part three of our series, I Am Jesus in His Own Words. I want to tell you a story to begin with. It's called Experiencing the Darkness. Back in 2002, when Becky and I got married in the summer of 2002, we decided to take our vacation to a place called Cozumel Island. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Cozumel. Anybody been to Cozumel before? Are we either on a cruise or straight there? Cozumel is a beautiful island off the coast of Mexico. It has wonderful beaches, great snorkeling, wonderful food, and uh, this is where we spent our honeymoon. And one day, we were driving around Cozumel, and we decided to do a little shopping. And so we were going from store to store, and here's one of the streets there in Cozumel. We were going from store to store and just enjoying some of the the artwork and the pottery and the clothing. It's a very tourist type of community, so there's lots of shops, great places to get deals and go shopping in. But we had stopped at one store, and the best way that I can describe it is like being in New Orleans and stopping at a local voodoo shop. And so we stopped there, and we just kind of poked our heads in for a moment. Literally took two steps in the door to kind of see what the shop was all about. And both Becky and I, in that very moment, felt a darkness kind of encroach over us as we stepped in. We took two steps in. We took five out. (laughs) And we knew immediately there's something wrong in here. There's a darkness in this place, and we stepped away from it immediately. Now, that's not the first time that we would experience darkness in our life, and it won't be the last time that we've experienced darkness in our life. And what I've discovered over the years is that there's two kinds of darkness in the world, and maybe you've experienced also, right? There's two kinds of darkness that exist in the world today, and here they are. There are things that we can see that we know that are dark and evil, And there are things that are unseen, that we cannot see physically, but we know the presence of evil and the presence of darkness exist. There are things that we can see all the time. War is an example of darkness, the travesty of war, desolation and destruction, innocent deaths. Abuse is another form of darkness. Whatever kind of abuse it may be, whether it's physical abuse or emotional abuse or spiritual abuse or a combination of all of these things. Injustice, when you see people being taken advantage of or discriminated against, whether because of their age, their sex, their race, or a combination of things. Bigotry, hatred, all of these things are examples of darkness that exist in our world. And can we, can we just acknowledge there's a lot of it in today's world? Amen? If you feel like there's a lot of it, just give me an amen. And there's a lot of it. But that's not the only kind of darkness, is there? There's also what I call the darkness that is unseen, right? Darkness that is unseen comes in two forms. One is what we generally classify as satanic or demonic activity. The darkness, the principalities, the rulers of this present age. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. The, the, the things that God invites us to put the full armor of God on to do battle against. Satan is demonic forces working against the light of Jesus Christ. That's one. But also, if we fully are aware of who we are, right, and we can just stop for a moment, there's darkness in each of us. You know that. That's why Paul says, the good that I want to do, I do not do, but the evil that's in me, that I keep on doing. Why? Because there's darkness in all of us. It's just the truth. It's just the truth. And Christ has come this Easter to rescue us from that darkness. And so two questions emerge, right? Number one, how do we navigate How do we navigate the darkness that is all around us in this world? And number two, what do I do? What do I do with the darkness that is in me? So first of all, like what I hope today's message will give you some foundation is, how do I navigate when I see dark and evil things in this world, right? 
How do I respond to them? How do I maintain composure in them? How do I shine light into them, right? And the second thing is, what do I do when I see the darkness kind of encroaching inside of me? right, when it starts to rear its ugly head, right, when, when things that I don't want to do I end up doing, and, 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 and how do I take that captive to Christ, okay? So that's the two questions we're going to wrestle with today. And we're going to do that by listening to Jesus. Because today, Jesus is going to tell, tell us about himself in a way that we need to listen to, to navigate these two realities. So if you will, go with me to John chapter 8, verse 12. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to John chapter 8, verse 12. And I'm also going to put it on the screen for you. And I would love for us to read this verse together, okay? So on the count of three, let's read it together, church. One, two, three. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. This beautiful image that Jesus chooses here should not come as a surprise to anyone. Because when you look in the Bible, from beginning to end, you see pretty clearly that God and light go together. They're like peanut butter and jelly. Biscuits and gravy, chicken and waffles, mashed potatoes and gravy, they just go together. God and light. Let me take you through a quick journey to, just, to explain what I mean by that. I'm going to take you through a very uh, two-minute journey through the Bible when it comes to God and light. For example, did you know that light begins the scriptures and light ends the scriptures? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, we hear this. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. Genesis 1, 3. But then if you jump over to Revelation 22, 5, here's what it says. And night will be no more, and they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Beginning and end, God's light is for his people. For 40 years in the wilderness, God led the people of Israel by a pillar of fire to light the way. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them what church? Light. Light, light so they could travel. In the Psalms, we hear of God being our light over and over again. Psalm 18 verse 28 says, For it is you who light my lamp, the Lord my God, and I love this phrase, lightens my darkness. Lightens my darkness. Psalm 27 one says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. I have nothing to be afraid of. Psalm 43 puts it this way. Send out your light, O Lord, and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling. So the light of God is what brings us into the presence of God. And in the prophets, we see the promise of the Messiah who will come as a light to the world. Isaiah 9, verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a what, church? A great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness had a light shine on them. And who is that light? It's Jesus. This is a prophecy about Christ. And at the end of time, we see that light is the image to reveal the glory of God shining upon the entire world. Isaiah 60, verse 1, puts it this way. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So when Jesus speaks these words of light, he's bringing together this rich energy from beginning to end, from the beginning of creation to the end of time, that weaves together through the pages of Scripture, especially when we come to today. And today we see that there's a backdrop to John chapter 8. There's a backdrop to the reading that we want to explore for just a moment. So if you've got your Bibles, go to John 7. Okay? 
John chapter 7 sets the stage for why Jesus tells us he is the light of the world. When Jesus makes this incredible self-revelation of not only who he is, but who God is, it's set within the context of a festival called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. It's the same thing when you hit the scriptures. Listen to John chapter 7 verse 2. He says this. Now the Jews had this Feast of Booths that was at hand. And so his brothers, that's the fellow disciples, they said to Jesus, listen, leave here. Go to Judea, specifically, go to Jerusalem, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. So let's pause there for a moment. This Feast of Booths, this Feast of Tabernacles. You may not know this, but the Feast of Tabernacles was the most popular Jewish celebration during the time of Jesus. It was the one that, every, it's, the, it's the party that everybody showed up for, Okay? It's the, it's the festival that people from all around Galilee and Judea would come to. Why? Because it was the feast of the harvest. It was the feast where they celebrated the gathering of the crops. It was a celebration surrounded with great joy and great praise and great thanksgiving for the God who provides. It was an eight-day festival. Woo! Eight days they were partying and celebrating together. It begins with a Sabbath rest, and it ends with a Sabbath rest. And in between, they're celebrating and offering sacrifices and praising God and rejoicing. And during this festival celebration, what would happen is everybody would come to town, but there wasn't enough light. There weren't no hotels or anything like that. So you know what they did? They put up these tents outside the city called booths. And they would live for eight days inside one of these tent booths. And while they were living there, they were remembering that God cares for them. They were remembering that for 40 years, their ancestors traveled around a wilderness, moving from place to place to place in tent booths. And God protected them. He cared for them. He provided for them. And now they are celebrating that reality. And as part of this celebration during this festival, right, they would go down to the temple. And as part of the temple, they would go into what is known as the court of the women. I'm going to put a diagram on the screen for you. I know it's kind of compressed and, and kind of, but if you look at the screen here, if you see kind of to your right, okay, so I'm going to turn around so I'm facing the same direction you are. If you look to the right, there's this thing called, I'm going to come up here, there's this thing called the court of the women, okay? The court of the women was where people would come to offer sacrifices and celebrations, right? The other side is where the great altar is and the holy place and the most holy place is. But this is the temple that Herod built in Jerusalem. This is where Jesus would be at. So when he's talking, he's probably in the court of women sharing this message. Now, during the feast, they had a very interesting celebration called the Celebration of Lights, It was during this time that the priests would come down and they would light some very special candles that were inside this open court to be burning day and night as a celebration of God's light in their life, to celebrate the goodness of God, to celebrate the provision of God, to celebrate the God who lit lit their way for 40 years. And so you can imagine all these people are in this court of women. There's a celebration taking place. There's lights lit. And here's what Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Will have the light of light. This beautiful moment in the life of God's people. This powerful statement of Jesus has some profound implications for our lives. The text makes it clear of three things today. And this is what I want to unpack for you. Number one, it's a light for the world. It's a light for their world. It's a light for our world. And it's a light for the generations to come. It's a light for the world. Number two, it's a light for those who are in darkness. And darkness can mean many things. It can be captivated by sin. It can be mean unenlightened. It means lack of understanding. 
There's whole kinds of things wrapped up in shame and guilt. Darkness can incorporate a whole bunch of things. And then it's a light that brings life. Because ultimately, that's what Jesus wants to give you. He wants to give you the abundant life now and the eternal life to come. This is who Jesus is. So let's walk through these implications for just a moment. Let's look at the impact of Jesus being our light. Number one, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Can I ask you all a question? How many of you have ever been in Lowe's or Target or Walmart and walked down the light aisle? You ever get overwhelmed by how many stinking light bulbs there are? And then you go to buy a light bulb and you realize it's the wrong kind? You know, it's one of those off ones that you don't normally replace in your house, like the little ones that are up underneath cabinets, and it's like, is that a 10 volt? Is that a 15 volt? Is it a wide or is it a thin? And you got to figure this out. It's crazy how many light bulbs there are, right? I mean, think about it, man. You got spotlights, floodlights, indoor lights, outdoor lights, soft lights, natural lights, incandescent lights, LED lights, multicolored lights, 15 watt, 40 watt, 60 watt, 100 watt, 200 watt. There's all kinds of options when it comes to light. But when you walk down the light of the world aisle, there are only two kinds of lights. One side of the aisle is the true light, and the other side is the false light. The true light of the world is Jesus. It's Jesus. Who he is, what he taught, what he did, and how he brings light into your life. The false side, right, the false light is, is, is everything else, right? It's the, it's the ideas and idols and other religions and false beliefs and teachings that rather than giving you a false sense of illumination that you understand and you recognize what's happening, it actually just darkens you further to Jesus. That's what false light does. It actually misguides us so that our ideas about Jesus are darkened rather than illuminated. Here's how John describes it in chapter 1 of his Gospels. He said, in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men and women. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. He has come to be the light that shines into our world, the true light. Now, here's the thing about this light. In many ways, the light of Jesus is both exclusive and inclusive. It's exclusive and in the sense that it's the only way. It is the only true light. But it's inclusive and then it's a light for everyone. And that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah, there's some exclusivity to Jesus, right? He is the only true light. He is the only light that lights the way. He's the only one who gives true understanding. He's the only one who can help us see ourselves for who we really are. But it's inclusive and it's, there's no discrimination. It's for everybody. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, white, black, red, and yellow, they are precious in his sight. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. Young, old, this light's for everyone. That's number one. Number two, Jesus is more powerful than the darkness. And sometimes we, you know, when when you start to see the darkness encroaching in this world, this is something, this is a truth you got to remind yourself all the time of, okay? So if there's anything you write down, you write down this. Jesus is more powerful than the darkness. And so when I see it encroaching, when I see it, evidence of it, when I hear it on the news and I watch it on, the, on, on, on television or on the computer screen, I get reports on my phone, I have to remind myself daily, Jesus is more powerful than the darkness. Why? Because number one, the light of Jesus always reveals what is hidden. You cannot keep secrets from Jesus. Psalm 90 verse 8 puts it this way. Oh God, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins. You know what happens to them? When they're placed in your light, they are revealed. They come out. They're distinguished in your presence. John 3 verse 19 puts it this way, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world And here's the truth that we have to recognize. Sometimes people are going to love darkness more than they love Jesus. 
And that's just the truth. People will love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be what? Exposed. Oh, I'm found out. Oh, somebody sees me. Oh, they know what I did. Oh, they see what's going on really in my heart. But whatever does what is true comes to the light so that may clearly seen his works have been carried out in God. And those works can be forgiven and redeemed. So number one, it reveals what is hidden. Number two, it guides in the midst of confusion. You ever had a moment where things in life just seem cloudy? You weren't sure the direction to go. The options weren't clear. The direction didn't seem evident. That's what darkness does. Darkness brings confusion. Have you noticed there's a lot of confused people in today's world? Why? Because that's what darkness does. See, truth illuminates so that you have confidence and you're not confused. Truth brings healing. Truth brings understanding. But the devil loves to confuse things. And so the light guides us in the midst of confusion. Psalm 119 verse 105 puts it this way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a what? Say it with me, church. A light to my path. You want to have your path lit? Illuminate it by God's word. Psalm 119 verse 130 puts it this way. The unfolding of your word gives what? Light. It in part, I'm going to love this because I feel like I'm a simple guy sometimes. <laughs> y- y'all need to mark this verse in your Bibles, right? It imparts understanding to the simple. Translated in Alabamian, right? It gives understanding to the stupid, okay? Y'all know what I'm, ta- y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Come on now. We're not as smart as we think we are, okay? Just live in the world long enough, right? You got to have understanding to the simple, right? Oh. I need understanding, and God's light does that. Number three, it brings us out of darkness. So not only does it reveal it, not only does it guide us through it, but ultimately it brings us out of it. Jesus says in John 12, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. I've come into the world as light, that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Did you know that God's love for you is so great that he doesn't want you to stay in darkness? He doesn't want you to live in darkness. He doesn't want you to be confused by darkness. He doesn't want you to be overwhelmed by darkness. He wants to shine through the darkness so that he can bring you out of that darkness. John 1 verse 5 puts it this way. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, no matter how much we see darkness in this world or darkness inside of us, we never want to lose sight of Jesus, who is the light of the world, because he defeated darkness. Go back a couple of weeks for a moment. Go back to Good Friday. On Good Friday, what did we see? We saw Jesus on the cross. We saw Jesus on the cross hanging in the midst of what? Darkness. We left this sanctuary in darkness. We left it in silence, in awe in reverence of what Christ had done for us. See, darkness thought it overcame Jesus on the cross. Darkness thought it won. But then Easter came. And the glory of the empty tomb revealed that darkness could not overcome Jesus, but that Jesus overcame darkness. And so whenever you feel, whenever you see, whenever you start to experience darkness encroaching in your world, 
Look to Jesus to shine some light to repel it. Look to Jesus to overcome it. Look to Jesus who has defeated it, both within you and in the world. Because every principality and force of darkness has been defeated at the cross by Jesus. It's why on Easter Sunday and every Sunday we can say these words, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Come on, let's say it, church. He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In my junior year of college, I was asked to serve as the chair of our religious committee on campus at Concordia University of Texas in Austin. I was excited about that role. But there were two things that I wanted to change right away that should have been indicative for my future. We changed the name because, to me, the idea of religious life on campus delegated to a committee just didn't sound right. So the first thing we did was we changed the name to Concordia Student Ministries. And the second thing we did was we adopted a theme, and it was called Shine. Now, we did that because at the time, one of my favorite songs that was out by a group called Newsboys was called Shine. And it was based on these beautiful words from Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, where it says, You are the light of the world, and a city on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, and I love this, he says, let your light shine before the world so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I love that song, and I love that verse. Now, to promote the theme, I decided to have a t-shirt made up with our new logo and the words of this song and scripture on the back. Of course, it wouldn't be a Pastor Dave production if it didn't have a misspelled word on it on the back of the T-shirt. I still wish I had that shirt to show because it was hilarious seeing people walk around with these T-shirts that I made, probably 200 of them with the word glorify fi on the back of it. But it was also cool to see how Jesus was helping this group of young college students embrace this reality. I'm the light of the world. You're the light of the world. We're the light of the world. And he wanted to take broken, and this was so important to me at the time, that he wanted to take broken, flawed, needy, sinful people and use them to be the light of the world on a college campus. And guess what? He takes a room full of broken, needy, sinful people and says, I want to do the exact same thing. I want you to be the light of the world. Why? Because I, this being Jesus, who is the light of the world, is giving you his light so that now you may shine. And church, what the world needs when there's darkness all around us, and what the world needs is when people are experiencing inner darkness, is nothing more than a church, a community, a group of believers who are shining as brightly as possible with the love of Christ. So this week, shine, shine. Let your light shine before all men so they may glorify your Father in heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all say together, amen, amen.